Ah, Formula One. There was a time when F1 was still exciting. Honestly, there was. I remember growing up and going round to my grandparents' house on a Sunday with my grandpa sat in his chair watching the Grand Prix. They're some of my earliest memories and they've stuck with me throughout my life, even as I attempted to become a racing driver myself. I didn't do very well jumping from series to series and occasionally getting too acquainted with the barriers, but that's not the point. I love racing and I used to love F1. I'm not saying it has to be dangerous to be exciting, but these days it's become so homogenised that it's difficult to get any pleasure out of it. Not like in the 90s, Formula One was always exciting and full of drivers that actually had character. I understand that it was also a bit too dangerous and we're moving away from combustion engines because, you know, fossil fuel, but god it was great to watch. However, the Formula One video games of the 90s were a bit of a mixed bag, to say the least. There were good games on all consoles, but if there was one company that stood for sports games in the 90s, it was Sega. For 10 years, Sega dipped their toes in the F1 water, but never really took the plunge. Games like Super Monaco GP didn't technically have any Formula One license. Not even F1 Circus MD had one, and that had F1 right in the title. Just look at some of these names. Lotas, Manabi, Jodan, Ferrari, McCrallen, and Williams. Okay, that one's just racist. Although saying all that, there is still no denying that Super Monaco GP is definitely still a classic for any F1 fan, despite the fact that it was fairly generic. But then again, the previous version in the arcade, just called Monaco GP, has one of the weirdest promotional posters you'll ever see for a racing game. Why a gold romper suit? Why knee-high boots of all things? That's not sexy. Not even for 1979. No, it wasn't until 1991 that we actually saw an F1 licensed Sega game, and it didn't even make it out of Japan. Fastest One technically had the license to the 1990 season. The tracks are licensed, but the teams and drivers' names are not. In fact, most of the Formula One drivers who participated in that season are somewhat present, just with slightly altered names. For example, Satoru Nakajima makes an appearance as S. Inakajima, and Mika Hakkinen becomes M. Hakayo with an exclamation mark. In 1991, however, Sega went whole hog and created both the F1 Exhaust Note arcade game, which, to be fair, was pretty advanced for the time, and also F1 Grand Prix Satoru Nakajima on the Mega Drive, using Japan's own hero as the game's spokesman. Person. This is an odd game in some ways because it breaks away from the frankly awful driving into a too close horizon style with a weird cityscape in the background kind of game. It instead goes for a top down view. It suffers from that annoying thing that all top down driving games have where the direction buttons feel like they're reverse when driving towards the bottom of the screen. But despite being semi licensed, it didn't have the rights to use real racing drivers' names other than Nakajima himself, so the developers had to make some up again. Now, despite the slight technical issues of it being complete and utterly f***ing bullshit, there was a sequel, this time called F1 Super License Satoru Nakajima, because just calling it F1 Grand Prix Satoru Nakajima 2 would have just been f***ing stupid. This is more or less the same game, except it has the 1992 F1 license, as well as some scantily clad underage girls, and the expert eye of Satoru Nakajima himself, who gives tips for each race in a language different to most of the rest of the game. For the Western markets, the jailbait was dropped in favour for a very different kind of fetish. Konami and Gremlin got the right to the mustachioed Lionheart that was Nigel Mansell. For this game, you take on the role of Sir Nige as he attempts to win the 1992 Formula One World Championship in good old Red 5. Who wants a moustache ride? I want one! I want one! I do! I do! I do! I do. <laughs> But it wasn't the only F1 game released in 92. If you didn't like Nigel Mansell, and to be fair I couldn't blame you, the guy was a bit of a back then, Sega had their own game in development which didn't have the F1 license, but did have arguably the greatest driver ever as its spokesperson and also as a consultant. The sequel to Super Monaco GP, titled Ayrton Senna's Super Monaco GP 2, was released in July of that year, and unlike Nigel Mustache's game, this was an exclusive to Sega, getting releases on the Master System, Mega Drive and Game Gear. It also got an arcade release with Ayrton himself doing the promotional work. Also, unlike Nigel Fuzzface's game, Senna was actually properly consulted on its development, even recording new quotes and tips straight away after getting off track at certain Grand Prix. As I say, this was also released on the Master System, but that one didn't have the same polished feel. The whole thing just feels a bit clunky, but 
then having said that, for the time that it was released, the Game Gear version was actually very impressive. Certainly more impressive than games being released on the Game Boy at that time. There was yet another F1 game released in 92, again in Japan only, and it was another Nakajima game called F1 Hero MD. But in the West, we got a slightly revised version of the same game, known as Ferrari Grand Prix Challenge. It's pretty much exactly the same, only with slightly less ludicrous pseudonyms and an official Ferrari license. But that's just the home systems, that's not even mentioning games like the officially licensed F1 Super Lap in the arcade. Virtua Racing also got a Formula One makeover, which went by the name Virtua Racer, or Virtua Formula, and came as part of a huge linked cabinet where players sat in replica Formula One chassis, although it did also come in smaller cabinets as well. But if 1992 was the year that turned everything around, then 93 was the year that things got big. Sega not only had an F1 license for their games, but they also were sponsoring a team in the championship, and also a Grand Prix too. You couldn't escape Sega branding at the 93 European Grand Prix at Donington Park. Not only were they sponsoring the Williams team, with both Sega and Sonic branding on the cars and the drivers, but Donington was also draped in Sega logos, with the large screens around the track made to look like Sega Game Gears, and also the grid girls dressed up like Sonic. Not to mention they commissioned a special Sonic the Hedgehog trophy that wasn't even the official trophy, and even floated a Sonic hot air balloon over the circuit. Quite rightly, they wanted to shout about it. Just have a flick through the Sonic the Hedgehog yearbook. You've got Sonic passing Damon Hill a Game Gear in a simulated pit stop. You've got Sonic sat in a Formula One car flogging the roadshow. You've even got him helping out the mechanics in Oh Hey M People! Which, for the record, I sent some of these pictures to Damon Hill and got this response. So let's try a game from the same year with Formula One World Championship Beyond the Limits on the Mega CD. Well, that's not the Sega thing, but okay. Presented by Sega Enterprises and Fuji Television. Oh, come on, you can have a sexy American trailer man voice, but you get rid of the Sega thing. Okay. No, 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 stop, stop it, stop it, okay? Just, we can't do this. As you'd expect, this game has the licensed teams, with the Williams team even having the Sega branding. Now, let's see. Oh, oh God, that's twitchy. Oh, no, no, this is not going well. Cows, why are the cows on the track? No, 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 okay, okay, this, no, enough, enough, enough. While the gameplay is horrible, it was notable for including the full motion video, and also introducing scenario modes that drop you into true-to-life situations from the 93 season, and you're tasked with matching or exceeding what happened in real life. Not that that's easy, of course, because the controls are just f***ing blasting bullshit. You might need to bleep that bit, actually. On the Mega Drive, the Master System, and the Game Gear, there was another game just called Formula One, or F1. This game was licensed by the FIA and Fuji Television, which means all of the official tracks are available to play, although everywhere seems to be in the middle of a field. It's okay, but underneath the F1 skin it's actually just another game called Vroom for the Atari ST. And while the gameplay is fairly decent, the narrow tracks and need to drive through gantries means that it sometimes feels like it's more about avoiding a crash than actually lapping at any decent pace. In 1994, F1 Circus made an appearance again, this time on the Mega CD. And not only did it have licensed F1 teams, you could even pick the season in which you wanted to compete. Unfortunately, the gameplay's not that great, as it's almost impossible to see where you're going. Meanwhile, our old friend Satoru was now appearing in games on the Super Nintendo, and dispensing with any form of humility in games like Nakajima Satoru F1 Hero 94. It's probably worth pointing out that by 1994 he'd actually retired from racing three years ago, but why mess with a winning formula? Also, having said that, he never actually, you know, won a race. 
In fact, he only even finished 40% of the ones he entered, but, you know. In the space of five years, there'd been over 20 F1 games released on Sega systems alone. It's hard enough trying to keep up with them all for this video, never mind at the time. But in 1995, things started to change in the console market. On the Mega Drive, we got what is one of the best of that era, with F1 World Championship Edition. It feels like a late release game, with great graphics, fully licensed teams, drivers and tracks, and fun gameplay. It's the right mix of simulator and arcade feel, although the oddly immovable advertising boards are a little bit strange. And weirdly, even if you pick Ferrari, the car's still blue. But with the changes in hardware, there'd only be a handful more games spread over the next two console generations. We start with F1 Challenge on the Sega Saturn. And at this point, in 1995, Sega was still the go-to console for sports games. But with PlayStation on the horizon, it wasn't going to be long before that mantle was taken away. Despite the crudeness of the 3D graphics and the glitchy audio on my emulator here, it's actually pretty good. It starts to feel like a proper racing simulator, although it still feels inferior to Sega Rally or Daytona USA. But while there wasn't another game on the Saturn, the Japanese console did get a media disc containing exclusive interviews with Ayrton Senna. While it's a Japanese release and the interviews are carried out by a Japanese engineer at Honda, the audio is actually entirely in English. For the Dreamcast is the Monaco Grand Prix series, which was also available on the PlayStation and the N64, but in Europe we actually also got an online version of the game, although servers are long gone and the game is actually quite rare now. But this is what it comes down to, the final set of Formula 1 games on Sega Systems, the F1 Grand Prix series, and they're not even exclusives. It got an N64 and a Game Boy Color release too, but I maintain that the Dreamcast version is still the definitive version. I think it's only right that I complete a race in honour of the Dreamcast and Sega's F1 years, racing on one of my favourite circuits in one of my favourite cars. Something's not right though, I don't feel like I'm appropriately dressed for this. Much better. Oh, well that was fun. Oh, oh, thank you. Well, that's it. That's the end of my journey through the Sega era Formula One games. And despite the overly aggressive AI drivers, it's actually still a great game. While I do like the modern Codemasters games, there's definitely more of a simulator feel to them than actually being games. And having raced in real life, I do appreciate the simulator side of it. But at the end of the day, I still want to have fun when I'm playing a game. And that seems to have been something that's lost these days. But anyway, until another season, I'll see you later.